What's up you guys, hey it's Buck Parker. So I did a lecture today at uh, St. Mark's and I had a difficult time with the tech. So I had uh, my lecture on the Mac and that was not compatible uh, with their system so it kind of got messed up. I was pretty disappointed. I did a ton of work for this uh, presentation so I figured I'd just do it on the camera and I'll record it on my screen here and then we'll mix and match and make a cool video for you and hopefully you guys who saw the lecture today all messed up, we'll get to see it <laughs> in its true format, okay? So what we're gonna talk about is shock, damage control, resuscitation, and tranexamic acid. I have no disclosures. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to get anyone to pay me to say this stuff, so I have no disclosures to uh, make. So what's interesting is every morning we get up, we see the news, and we have all these crazy news stories about these terrorists here, there, whatever, and you know, like this one here is terrorist uh, trained deaths since 2010, 185 people, oh my God, terrorist trained deaths. But the real thing, what's really going on is that we have traumatic deaths, over 150,000 traumatic deaths per year in the United States and over 3 million non-fatal injuries in the United States. And so that's really the news, that's the real news, you wanna say. So instead of, the news talking about the terrorist attacks which cause a very, very small problem. They should be talking about the other issues with the other traumatic injuries and the people who save lives and are you know there to help these people, which are you guys. This is the healthcare industry, nurses, PAs, NPs, techs, radiology techs, scrub techs, my favorite scrub techs, right? All these people, obviously doctors too, and everybody in the healthcare industry. So that's the real news to me. So what we're gonna go over is shock. Number one, we're gonna talk about definition, pathology, stages, and types, and then damage control resuscitation. We'll talk about definition stages and specific maneuvers we can do. And then TXA or tranexamic acid and the pharmacology uh, behind that, the data behind it, adverse effects, and then it's recommendations. First, I wanna talk about my favorite subject, me. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, actually, it's one of my favorite subjects, not my favorite subject, but anyway, uh, I'll tell you about myself. If you don't know about me very much, my name is Buck Parker. I'm a board certified general surgeon. I trained at Henry Ford Hospital as a level one trauma center. I finished in 2010 in general surgery. Basically, you go through all these different specialties. So GI surgery, trauma surgery, transplant vascular plastics, cardiac, endocrine and gastric bypass surgery, did all those. But Henry Ford was a, a large 900 plus bed hospital, or 900 bed hospital, uh, 60 ICU beds. It's in downtown Detroit. There's lots of trauma there. There's gunshot wounds, there's stabbings, there's bad MVAs every single day there. So we saw lots and lots of trauma and a lot of, most of the residents got very used to lots of trauma. So that's kind of what how I ended up in the trauma sort of world. Right now I work at uh, St. Mark's uh, Hospitals of Level, which is is actually uh, transitioning from a level three to a two. I'm helping them do that. And then I work at a couple other level two hospitals as well. Also during my residency, I did some research for NASA and Henry Ford. We did ultrasound for space trauma. And we got to, I got to go play on the zero gravity plane and experience zero gravity myself. And we did some studies in zero gravity. So that was kind of cool. The other thing I did was kind of cool is that I spent 28 days on a deserted island with 14 other guys for a TV show. I don't know if you guys know Bear Grylls. He's from the UK, he's like a survivalist, he has lots of TV shows. Anyways, I was on one of them. I was part of the medical team there. And what it was is that we had 14 guys on a deserted island for 28 days, no food, water, or supply, or limited supplies, and no crew. So there's no camera crew. We were the camera crew. That was the whole catch of that. I like it because, you know, as far as medically, it was very interesting that I got to experience a starvation firsthand. And, you know, if my patients are NPO, a lot of my patients are NPO, and they go, oh my God, I've been NPO for a day or two days. I'm like, hey, that's nothing. I was NPO for like 28 days. No, I really wasn't NPO for 28 days. but. I definitely, we definitely did starve. I lost 20 pounds in uh, 28 days and I don't have a lot of pounds to lose so it was pretty tough. Anyways, pretty interesting stuff. The other thing I do sometimes is I speak, uh, or get invited to speak on some of the news channels, uh, CNN, uh, Fox News, 
uh, Fox Business News, those, are the, those pictures there. And I'll just tell you that, you know, sometimes, uh, like TV is really cool, it's fun, but sometimes you look great, like when the picture on, in Fox News there on the left, the one on the right, I look like a psycho, and on the bottom, I look like I'm sleeping. So you never kind of know what you're gonna look like on TV, but it is kind of fun. Just know, every once in a while, they catch you in a really bad angle, okay, it's bad light, and so you end up looking like this. So what I do now is I have an Instagram, YouTube page, you might be watching this on YouTube right now, and I have a website where I help college, high school, college, and med students with their journey through medical school or into medical school and residency, and hopefully I can inspire some of those students to become surgeons and help them make that step. It's because I really enjoy surgery, I, medicine is awesome, it's a really fun, it's all very challenging, but it's also a great rewarding career, and so if I can help other people do that, that'll be great. And I think we need a lot of smart people in medicine right now, it's kind of changing, there's a lot of big problems in medicine, I think they can be solved. We need the best of the best, and I think for a while there, the medicine was not really cool enough to go into, and it was kind of, it kind of gets a bad rap here and there, but I think it's really awesome, and it'll be a lot better, and I'm hoping to inspire the next generation of uh, surgeons or, and or doctors who can fix those problems. So I'm not really that smart. I can't really fix those things. Hopefully, we can find some, somebody to do that, and maybe you guys are one of them. So let's get to uh, what we're here to talk about, and that is shock is the first topic, okay? So definition of shock so is People talk about shock and be like a hypotension, you know, tachycardia, all that stuff, but that's not really what shock is. Shock is inadequate end organ perfusion or really tissue perfusion or lack of oxygen to that tissue, okay? That's really the de definition of shock. And what happens in shock? We have inadequate tissue perfusion of oxygen, and then which leads to cells that switch from anaerobic metabolism to a, sorry, they switch from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. The cell uses ener or produces energy by using oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, uh, we can't produce a, as much energy. We can produce a little bit of energy. Just to give you an example, with oxygen, we produce 38 ATP, right, per electron. I think it's per electron, um, don't quote me on that one. And without oxygen, we create, we create two ATP, so it's a big difference. So if we don't have oxygen, the cells cannot create enough energy to function, and essentially they can end up dying if it goes long enough. So lactic acid production, so when you're in anaerobic metabolism, you develop lactic acid. Some of you guys uh, understand and know how this works. The cell function stops. So the, whatever the cell is supposed to do, if it's a neuron, is you know, supposed to have uh, electron, uh, electronic transfer of information, right? That stops functioning. Membrane becomes permeable, and so uh, the things inside the cell are, start to come outside, and the things outside start to come inside. And then electrolytes and fluid leak out of the cell, like the same thing I was talking about. Potassium, sodium, chloride, calcium, all these things start to get exchanged through the membrane of the cell because it can no longer hold the inside of the cell, it can no longer hold, hold the contents in the cell, it starts to leak out. The, the sodium potassium pump, which is, uh, keeps the electrolyte content, uh, starts to get impaired, and then mitochondrial damage, the mitochondria, the things that uh, inside the cell that actually produce the ener energy, and so once the energy source is gone, then the cell is gonna die, and then cell death. So that is the pathophysiology, essentially, of shock. So there's uh, like basically four stages of shock. Initial stage is hypoperfusion or hy hypoxia. We develop anaerobic metabolism, which is what we talked about, and lactic acid buildup. You don't have a lot of changes in, you may have a little bit of changes, it's clinically of the patient, but you typically don't see a lot of changes of the patient in the initial initial shock stage. Compensatory shock then is when you have physiologic mechanisms employed in attempt uh, to reverse the shock. So this is when you, your heart rate goes up, your respirations go up, your blood vessels tighten, you start changing the physiology of the body to keep up with this uh, lack of perfusion, the lack of oxygen. Progressive shock is when you have the compensatory mechanisms then fail. So then your blood pressure starts to drop. You can't hold that blood pressure anymore with all those mechanisms in place. Your heart rate goes up, your blood vessels tighten, but you still can't hold that blood pressure up, the normal blood pressure, so you have failure of those compensatory mechanisms. And then refractory shock is when the organs have failed, the shock no longer can be reversed. So this is uh, bad news, and obviously we start to circle the drain at this point. 
So uh, this is just a, a dumb little cartoon here. It says, you know, the patient's in shock, but what kind? So the question is, there's, there's shock, but there's lots of different kinds. So we're gonna talk about five different types of shock. And some people name them a little bit differently, but this is how I name them. So at first we have cardiogenic shock, where the heart is actually failing to pump the blood and pump the oxygen to the uh, cells. We have uh, hemorrhagic shock, where you're bleeding and then you're losing uh, all the blood. The blood, the blood is the oxygen carrying capacity of uh, the body. We have anaphylactic shock, right? So we have this uh, swelling of all the tissues and we can't, in this massive vasodilation and we can't hold up our blood pressure. And then we have septic shock, and this does a similar thing, where it vasodilates massively, and we, have, we can't hold the blood pressure, we can't perfuse the vessel or the organs because uh, there's so much uh, vasodilation. And then we have neurogenic shock, with, where the blood vessels uh, no longer are uh, innervated and they just relax, and so we can't keep that blood pressure up. So those are types of shock. So we'll talk specifically about hemorrhagic shock because this is a kind of a trauma talk, and. Honestly, this is the most fun type of shock is hemorrhagic shock. So hemorrhagic shock accounts for about 30 to 40% of all fatalities, second only to a traumatic brain injury as a cause of death after or following trauma. So we we're talking about those 150,000 deaths per year due to trauma, 30 to 40% of those are due to hemorrhagic shock. So this is a great place where we can intervene and save a lot of people. And hemorrhagic shock is basically categorized into four categories. So we have class one, two, three, and four. And if you see there in the first or the second column, I guess you'd say is uh, class one and the blood loss is about up to 15%. And we say up to about 750 cc's, but this is we're talking about you know a standard 40 or a standard 70 kilogram male. This is uh, about 15%. Two is 15 to 30. Three is 30 to 40. And four is over 40% blood loss of your body. Now total body uh, blood is usually about five liters. So you can base that on those. So 40% is about two liters. So the interesting thing about shock is that the is category one or stage one is really you don't see a lot of clinical change in the patient. You start to lose some blood, but you may not see tachycardia, you may not see uh, blood pressure drop, you may not see respiratory rate increase. So you can't really tell this patient is in shock yet, but they have lost blood. Uh, you may or may not see a pulse pressure decrease. You know, the patient may have a, a little anxiety, or it may they may not, they may appear totally normal. So. That's uh, something to pay attention to. Even though they're losing blood, you sometimes don't know it. Class two is even more interesting because you're losing 15 to 30 percent of your blood or your total blood, but you really only have maybe one, you know, pulse pressure decreases and maybe you're tachycardic, maybe the heart rate is 102 or something. This is something that's not really gonna get my ears to perk up a lot. If somebody tells me this patient's tachycardic at 102, I'd be like, eh, well, okay, let's go see what's going on and see what happens, you know. Uh, it may or may not be a problem. I mean, somebody that's just anxious or in pain could be tachycardic to 102, right? So you may not experience any, or you may not detect any uh, issue with that patient uh, because it's these are the subtle signs of shock. Now the capillary refill may be a little bit delayed, but it's kind of tough to tell too. In some patients, older patients, they may be delayed, and so you may not notice, right? And then the patient may be mildly anxious and uh, a little bit more than slightly anxious. I, that doesn't really tell us. That's kind of tough to, to decide too. Now class three is when we start to lose a lot of blood and we maybe start to get behind the eight ball if we're not paying attention to what was happening in class one and class two. So we're more tachycardic on 120s. You know, your heart rate, uh, pulse pressure is going, uh, so your heart rate is going up. Your blood pressure starts to decrease. Now that's, this is a, a you know, so these are big indicators here. Now your heart rate is 120, your blood pressure decreased. Now you, you know you have a problem, but you may be behind the eight ball, maybe too late right now. So your capillary refills increased and your pulse pressure is way decreased, right? So then the patient's anxious, they're confused, they don't know what's going on, they're starting to not perfuse their brain. Like this is starting to get late stages. And then four is even more tachycardia up to one, uh, over 140s. Blood pressure is way down, pulse pressure is way down, respiratory rates way up, and they're lethargic or they can't, you know, really function because their brain is not getting oxygen. So those are all important. It's uh, very important to remember that, and it's very important to when you see a patient that comes in and they possibly have hemorrhagic shock, they got hit by a car, 
or you know they have an MVA or something like that. They don't have any external signs of bleeding, but they're a little confused. They don't know what's going on. It could be multiple things. It could be a head injury, but it also could be a bad liver laceration that's they're bleeding internally, and they have already lost a good 30 percent of their blood volumes. You need play uh, pay very close attention to that. So let's talk about damage control resuscitation. Damage control resuscitation is essentially a systematic approach uh, to the management of the trauma patient. We're basically starting, you know, we say the emergency room right here, but really it starts before in the ambulance when the paramedics show up, when the first responders show up. You're trying to control the damage that's been that's going to happen or is happening, right? So if there's a, a, instance of this is, um, or an example of this is, so paramedic shows up and a patient uh, has a limb laceration, they're bleeding profusely, they put a tourniquet on. This is part of damn control resuscitation. So this is part of first responders and a paramedic's job too. So, but basically it goes every, from the first contact with the patient of, of a healthcare provider up until the ICU and this is, there's several different stages, but this is damage control resuscitation. And the reason we care about damage control resuscitation is because we have this thing called the lethal triad. And the lethal triad is what happens to a patient when they're in hemorrhagic shock and they start bleeding. And so what happens is if we start at the lactic acidosis there, you start, you start bleeding and you have less oxygen carrying capacity in the blood, then you start going to anaerobic metabolism, you, you develop lactic acidosis. When you develop lactic acidosis and you develop metabolic acidosis in, right, in, your, in your blood, in your physiology, your body becomes acidotic. What happens when you're acidotic? You have decreased myocardial uh, function or performance. You, have, you can have hypotension. You have increased degradation of fibrinogen, which fibrinogen is the thing that keeps all the, the platelets together and to form that clot. So if you have decrease of all of those things, then right, you have hypotension, your, your body starts to squeeze, uh, take the blood from the periphery, go and shove it into the vital organs, the brain, the heart, right? So there are the lungs, and so it takes all those that blood away and you start to lose heat. So you, once, you, once you lose heat, the coagulation factors that help you clot are also heat based. And so if their temperature is not right, then they start to de they have dis dysfunction. And once they have dysfunction, you can't clot anymore. Once you bleed more and you can't clot, then you have more bleeding. Once you have more bleeding, then you have lactic acidosis. So then you end up with this cycle of terrible things happening. And this is why we need to intervene. This is why we care about damage control resuscitation because we need to stop this uh, cycle. So I have a little video here, it's clot formation. Cell fragments called platelets or thrombocytes make up about 2% of blood. Platelets stop blood loss from damaged vessels. When a blood vessel tears, platelets at the site adhere to the wall of the vessel to close the tear. The shape of the platelets changes as they liberate the contents of their vesicles. This enables them to connect to one another. Platelets also release chemicals that activate the coagulation system to promote blood clotting. Blood proteins known as clotting factors form fibrin threads. Millions of platelets together with the fibrin threads form a platelet plug. If the tear is small enough, the plug can stop blood loss completely. Cool, so that was just a little video to show you how platelets and fibrinogen work. Uh, there's a lot of other things that are going on in the, in the clot, but that's the basis of that. So we're going to talk about early, sorry, uh, damage control resuscitation, and it's basically multiple phases. So early blood product transfusion, uh, permissive hypotension, arrest uh, and temporization of ongoing hemorrhage, uh, damage control surgery, and then restoration of physiologic stability after that. So let's talk about each one of these. Early blood products, basically what happens is uh, we used to give crystalloid or ringer's lactate or normal saline when a patient comes in the uh, ER and uh, we say, oh, they're hypotensive, let's give them a bunch of fluids and see what happens. Well, we found over time that it's, uh, crystalloid is really not a great, uh, great thing to give and it's better if we can give them blood products. So we found that if you give blood products right away, the patients do a lot better. Now, if they have massive hemorrhage, then we uh, we've developed this thing called Massive Transfusion Protocol, which is if you think somebody's going to require more than 10 units of blood over 24 hours, then we should institute this Massive Transfusion Protocol because we found that we used to just give lots of red blood cells, okay, or packed RBCs, and the packed RBCs would be great, but then we kind of dilute the blood and we don't have any clotting factors and we have, even though we have oxygen carrying capacity, but we don't have the clotting capacity. So then over time we developed the massive transfusion protocol which, which then 
it has turned into really one, for every one unit of packed RBC, you give a unit of FFP and a unit of platelets. So then you go one, 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 and we call it the one to one to one ratio. And when we do that, then we have much better outcomes and we have less patients die of hemorrhagic shock. So this is the uh, massive transfusion protocol. And essentially, there's a, bit, a couple big studies to show that the, to, the benefit to this, and this one is called the PROMET stu uh, study. And essentially, this was a large observational multicenter uh, major trauma transfusion study, that's what it was called. It took patients who were in hemorrhagic shock and gave them RBCs and plasma uh, together one to one, and then also RBCs and platelets together one to one. And they figured out that if you give either one of those, they, in, their improved uh, outcome, they have less uh, hemorrhagic death over the first 24 hours and uh, 30 day mortality. Um, it, as opposed to if you give just uh, like say five packed, uh, five units of packed cells. And so then they went on to essentially do one to one to one and the one to one to one was even better than the one to two. So like you give two units of packed RBCs to one unit of FFP, then that was even better. So the one to one to one ratio is really turning out to be the best probably ratio we can give. So this is the proper study, which is another large uh, randomized clinical trial. And what they showed was a significant de uh, decrease in the 24 hour mortality of the one to one to one group compared to the one to one to two even. So uh, that's just another study showing the one to one to one is much better. What was also interesting is they showed that there was no difference in the complications, including acute respiratory distress syndrome, which we often associate with uh, massive blood transfusions. So there was no difference in just giving packed RBCs to the platelets and the plasma, which I think a lot of people associate with the uh, ARDS. So St. Mark's has a MTP and it basically is physician activated. So if a patient comes in the ER, uh, the ED physician or the trauma surgeon, whoever, whoever's uh, there can call, can call the massive transfusion protocol. You can put it in the order system or you can have a nurse. The nurse can call up the blood bank and say, we need to activate the massive transfusion protocol and they will do that. The massive transfusion protocol is also automatically um, instituted if there's more if there's more than 10 uses of packed cells uh, ordered or, or transfused over uh, less than 24 hours. So then the blood bank will automatically institute it. And what it does, um, oh, sorry, the nurse contacts transfusion services. So, uh, and here's the tests that are associated with this. And what happens is uh, all these tests get ordered automatically. You get a type and cross match. All the nurses know the uh, tubes and stuff like that to be uh, the blood drawn uh, much more than I do. But you do get, uh, so essentially a patient gets uncross matched blood initially. And then uh, within uh, five, five, well, within 10 to 15 minutes, we should have a typed blood. And then about 45 minutes, uh, 30 to 45 minutes, you'll have cross-matched blood. The other labs you'll get are an INR, a calcium, potassium, and you get eye stats and all, all those uh, bloods will be tr uh, drawn right away as well. You also get a coag panel, fibrinogen, and uh, of course CBC and all that good stuff. So the MTP uh, blood product pack A is four units of packed uh, RBCs as well as four units of FFP. Uh, and then after that is pack B, so that's in a cooler, uh, ready to go all, at all the, all the time. So pack B is four units of FFP in a cooler, four units of uh, packed cells, one unit of platelets, and actually one unit of platelets is essentially like the six pack of platelets. Uh, we usually talk about our eight pack of platelets and then uh, one to 10 of cryo, and those are both in non-coolers. Uh, so the, the blood components you'll get is uh, packed RBCs, FFP, and platelets, and as well as cryo. Um, test results, uh, you will, they'll be automatically triggered to get uh, a PT INR, as well as platelets and uh, fibrinogen levels throughout those that massive transfusion and once if they come back if you're more than you know if your INR is more than 1.4 you'll get two or more units of FFP if you're uh, still active bleeding you can continue to get F, uh, packed red blood cells and if your fibrinogen is uh, l less than a uh, 100, you'll get uh, one to 10 units of uh, fibrinogen and, um, or cryo, I'm sorry. And then if the platelets are less than 80,000, 
then that'll trigger a unit of uh, platelets as well. Some other labs you'll get is a calcium I talked about, potassium. Once those labs are triggered, if those are low, then those will automatically be called to replace as well. So that's kind of how the St. Mark's uh, MTP works. So let's go on to permissive hypotension. This is kind of uh, maybe a controversial topic, but it's actually very interesting. Some people that I know, uh, Dr. Matt Carrick in Texas did a study with Dr. Maddox in 2011, where they brought in uh, these trauma patients who were penetrating injury and then ended up needing to have hemorrhagic shock and ended up going to the operating room. And uh, they have a large uh, hospital there. They have lots of this uh, going on. So they they decided to, uh, they built a study around uh, permissive hypotension and that was letting the MAP or the mean arterial pressure get down to around 50 and just keeping it above 50. Now most people say, well you should really have it above 60, 65, even 70 sometimes. But these guys said, no, you know, if we have permissive hypotension, well, basically the thought behind that is that if you're blowing all this product and crystalloid into the patient and you're increasing their pressure, then you're probably blowing that clot, that initial clot out off as well. So the patient, you know, the blood drops to a certain level, you start to clot and then you push a bunch of product in there and then they blow the clot off, they start bleeding some more. So that was the theory behind that. And it ended up being basically a hemorrhagic shock uh, requiring surgery, target map of 50. Um, ended up, they, in this study, they uh, required less products and less uh, crystalloid transf transfusion, less post-op coagulopathy. Uh, they had lower INRs overall and they had no difference in mortality and actually what ended up happening is the people who were regulating the study didn't want the study to go on because they thought they were hurting people but they didn't have all the data yet. Uh, so they stopped the study early but it, what ended up happening is they had a trend towards decreased mortality. Um, so they went back and had some other studies and it proved that uh, the permissive hypotension is, is okay down to a MAP of 40. Now that's also in patients that are non-head injured patients, but I think they're doing a study to uh, prove that that's okay in head injured patients as well, because a lot of times we think about, we have to keep the CPP up, right, the uh, cerebral perfusion press pressure, and we don't want to drop the MAP too much because that causes the CPP to drop, and then they don't have uh, oxygen to their brain. So that's being sorted out. Uh, going on from there, the, the next step in basically the uh, the, Damage. The next step in the damage control resuscitation would be arrest or temporize the hemorrhage. So I have a little a video for you here, and this is um, an ED thoracotomy, and we'll just uh, kind of walk through that this real quick. Take it on across. You're going to have to go right on across up there. Open that chest up more. Open up the chest more up there. Take it on. Take your scissors on up there. Get the big plant for the aorta. So as you can see, uh, ED thoracotomy is quite a disaster. Sometimes can be. The patient basically arrests in front of you, and if they have a penetrating injury to the chest, that's basically the only time it's really recommended. And they arrest in front of you, then it's uh, indicated to do ED thoracotomy, which is essentially anterolateral thoracotomy from the sternum down to the table, just under the left nipple, which in, in men in fourth or fifth intercostal space, you, know, you open the ribs of the spreader, and then you get in there and there's a couple things you can do. One is um, you can tamponade or you can relieve the tamponade. So if there's a stab wound to the heart, 
then the heart will bleed. It goes into the pericardium. Pericardium will trap that blood and cause a tamponade to the heart. If you can open the pericardium, just medial to the phrenic nerve, then you uh, release the uh, tamponade effect and then you need to find and fix the hole in the heart. And there's a, a bunch of different ways to do that. One is just suturing it, one is you know placing a foley in there and taking the operating room, all sorts, sorts of things like that. But essentially you need to fix that hole. The second thing you do is clamp the aorta uh, in the chest and that uh, what that does is stop the hemorrhage if there's hemorrhage distal to the aorta where you clamp it and perfuse the brain. So you want you basically are going to buy more time for the brain to survive so you can take that patient to the operating room and get con definitive control of the hemorrhage. So that's the that's the exciting one. There's lots of other things you can do in the ER. Obviously uh, uh, pressure is number one so a lot of times uh, even just if it's a femoral artery, you can hold pressure on the femoral artery uh, just with one finger or two fingers, and that'll be enough to completely occlude that artery and stop all the hemorrhage. So that's uh, number one. Number two is just is sewing. So lots of scalp injuries, they can bleed a lot. You need to sew those up really tight and you can create a tamponade effect as well. So those are kind of the arrest, temporize, uh, the hemorrhage. Oh, I forgot, uh, of course, the tourniquets. So if there's, a if there's a tourniquet, if you have a patient that comes in, and they have hemorrhage at the extremity, you can place an tourniquet on them until you get to the operating room. Those last for you know six, even eight hours sometimes, uh, you can uh, have those tourniquets on. So there's lots of things we can do uh, in the ED. There's Reboa, which is a resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, and that's essentially putting a balloon up into the aorta. So the catheter goes up the femoral artery uh, into the iliacs and then the aorta, and once the balloon is pro in the proximal aorta, thoracic aorta, then you inflate the balloon and you include the thoracic aorta. And essentially, you do the same thing as you do with a, with a clamp and you stop the uh, hemorrhage uh, below the diaphragm if that's what's going on. And um, you uh, perfuse the brain and give, you give uh, that person more time to get to definitive uh, surgery or definitive arrest of the hemorrhage. So next we get to damage control surgery. This includes things like temporary uh, intravascular shunts. So if there's a blood vessel, if you're in surgery now and there's a blood vessel, uh, there's lots of, <laughs> lots of problems with the patient and there's a blood vessel that needs to be uh, repaired and it's gonna take a long time, you can put a shunt in there and it's just basically a little rubber or elastic tube you place uh, in the vessel to shunt that blood around. Second thing you can do is uh, vessel ligation. Essentially, we can we can ligate almost any vessel except the SVC and the uh, IVC. Uh, it's very morbid if you ligate the uh, uh, iliacs, uh, but you can do that. You try not to do that, of course, if you don't have to, but in certain situations, that's the only option left and you have to do that, that's okay. So, uh, and then finally, well not finally, but temporary abdominal packing. So if, for instance, the liver, is uh, you know just like big car accident, the liver's exploded into a bunch of pieces and you can't really sew anything. The liver's very difficult to sew. We can pack it with a bunch of packs and leave those in and take the patient to the ICU, correct everything else. They give them platelets, give them uh, coagulation factors, give them you know fibrinogen, all that stuff, and and help that patient clot while it's packed tight, um, and then bring them back in four hours, six hours, or even twelve hours, and take those packs out, and hopefully that has helped uh, tampon off that bleeding. Uh, here's just another picture of a different type of packing, abdominal packing. We can leave that in. You don't have to close the patient um, always after surgery. You can leave that in, take them to the ICU, like I said, uh, correct everything else, try and get them to stop bleeding uh, with the packing inside. And then once once you do that, if you're not gonna close them right away, we do temporary abdominal uh, closure. So this is something called the Abthera we use a lot. And that blue thing is actually um, just a plastic that keeps the uh, bowels away from uh, the top blue portion, which is which is a sponge. And the sponge it acts like uh, we have a suction device on top of the sponge, and we can suck the fluid and/or blood out of the abdomen and keep the bowels separate uh, with the plastic kind of barrier. That's what it looked like from the outside, and then this is kind of. An example of what it would look like if you placed it on a patient. After all that stuff is done, um, I did forget one thing I, I've noticed today uh, when I was doing the lecture that is uh, that I didn't include, which is angiography. And so, if we have uh, somebody who has a fractured pelvis and we get them to the ED and we uh, realize they have a fractured pelvis and we think they're bleeding from their pelvis, the best thing really for that patient is the angiography suite, and we can go there. And that's part of kind of the damage control surgery slash 
uh, well, it's a por portion of his resuscitation, but it's uh, kind of damage control uh, surgery and or re uh, arrest of the hemorrhage. So uh, that's also an option. So then we want to make sure we have restoration of physiologic uh, stability. And one of the ways we do that is by using the TAG or ROTEM. It's uh, basically uh, looking at the uh, clotting um, essentially the, or the clotting profile of the blood. And this right here gives us the clotting profile. This is um, essentially up and down is like the magnitude or the, the strength of the clot. And then the crossways is time. And so we see the first red um, uh, line here. That is the time to clot. So the time it takes your body to start initial, initializing a clot, that is the R time. And then the amplification where it starts to go up, that's uh, how fast that clot is forming. And if it's a very steep line and it's forming super fast, if it's very low, then it's not forming very fast. And then the amplitude is the total. Uh, there we say maximum ampl amplitude, I had it written sideways. And that's the strength of the total clot. And then from there, the red line kind of dips down or it forms almost like a look, looks like a tail. And that is the fibrinolysis. And so how fast is that clot being uh, broken up by your body, your body's natural enzyme. So plasmin is one of those enzymes that always breaks down clot. So your body is always continuously balancing clotting and, and not clotting because we need to clot when we bleed, but we don't need to clot everything off, otherwise our blood wouldn't circulate and be, that'd be a big problem. So we're constantly balancing this, but in trauma patients, we have this massive um, attempt of our body to uh, destroy all clots in addition to clotting. If we have too much destruction of clot, then we'll have this super fast fibrinolysis. So this is a thromboelastogram, and this is what shows, this is what tells us, uh, there are, these are the different kind of profiles of the different problems we have. So the first one is pretty normal. You see a short little uh, kind of nose on it, I guess, and then you have um, a ramp up time and then the, the uh, black bar almost looking thing. The second one is is a long nose, that means a long time to start clotting. So that those are factor deficiencies. And so those factors are found in uh, FFP. And the second one is a, is almost like a thin one. It looks like a test tube. Uh, that's a, pl a platelet, platelets are being blocked so the clot is not very strong. The uh, one, let's see, one, two, three, four, the one, fourth one down is uh, the clot forms, but then it goes away quickly and that's fibrinolysis. So that's the, when you have the presence of TPA or this plasmid that breaks down the clot really fast. And then the uh, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth one is hypercoagulable or hy hypercoagulation where you have this really, really thick clot and that's that, or that, I mean, thick black stripe and that means they're a very strong clot. And then the uh, last two are DIC stage one and stage two. First. DIC is very, you clot a lot and then it starts to lice and then after a while you have this hypocoagulable state where you never really form a great clot because all those factors are used up, right? So right about now you're thinking, oh my God, I can't remember all this stuff. I need a break. I am not going to give you some wine. However, I'm going to give you something that will help you remember how, what to do when you see a thromboelastogram. So this, in this one, we want to give FFP and I'll show you why. So this may or may not be familiar to you. The first one is a brandy snifter. The second one is a wine glass. The third is a uh, test tube that may be more uh, appropriate for this lecture. The third, the one, two, three, four. Fourth is a um, upside down martini glass. And the, the last one is a champagne flute. And this tells you what you need to do for each one of these. And, and this uh, has the correlating thromboelastogram on the right hand side. So the first one is a, supposedly a normal one. The brandy snifter is a normal uh, thromboelastogram, so you don't have to do anything. It's uh, normal clotting. The second one, you have a long um, nose on it, and you have a factor deficiency, so you want to give FFP because that's what's uh, in FFP. Um, the platelets, uh, the, the, sorry, the third, third one is a test tube, it's a skinny one. You want to give platelets because the platelets are not sticking to each other, forming a good strong clot. And the the uh, fourth one is martini glass. You're gonna, you're having that uh, fibrinolysis really bad, so you want to give TXA initially, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the, in the uh, uh, next few slides. So TXA breaks that stops that breakdown of the clot. And then the last one, I'm not sure if that champagne flute really looks like uh, that hypercoagulable one. But in that point, at that point, you want to give cryo because if this is DIC, 
uh, you need lots of fibrin because that's what happens is the fibrin gets sliced. So the other thing we want to do is, is uh, make sure when, once we get them to the ICU, we correct all their coagulopathy and then we give them an appropriate amount of fluid. We don't, we don't want them to ha be under resuscitated or over resuscitated. We found over the last you know, 10, 15 years that uh, less fluid is better, but you need to give them enough so that way the heart works. You know, with a Frank Starling curve where the uh, heart you know, uh, uh, if you load the heart appropriately in the sweet spot, then it uh, contracts and it pushes a maximum amount of blood through the heart. If you don't load it enough, it's not gonna uh, then uh, push very much. If you load it too much, then it's weak. It's a weak contraction and you can't push. And this is essentially what that this is showing here. Uh, so restricted fluids on the left and liberal fluids on the right, uh, you could have uh, the same problem with both sides, essentially hypertension, tachycardia, um, uh, organ dysfunction on both sides. So we need really need to hit that sweet spot of resuscitation. The way we do that is by monitoring everything. And we need, uh, a lot of times we have these patients, they have an A-line. Um, of course, they have a blood pressure cuff, but it's not really that great. A-line is better. And if we can do esophageal Doppler, if they're intubated or something like that, that's been shown to be very accurate in uh, fluid resuscitation. And then also like a flow track or a clear site or something like that to monitor cardiac output, uh, systemic vascular resistance. Uh, get all those numbers so we can know exactly where we're at and we can um, uh, give them enough fluids but not too much all right so the other thing we want to make sure we do is that uh, it is replace the electrolytes especially calcium and magnesium because this, there's citrate in the uh, product so the right red blood cells ffp platelets they have citrate is in those and you give a lot of that citrate will bind the magnesium and calcium take it out of the blood and then you have hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia and then the heart doesn't work and the blood vessels don't work and the and the right smooth muscle doesn't work and so you can't keep that blood pressure going you can't keep that heart uh, pumping well so we need to make sure that all those things are happening at the same time while we're doing this massive transfusion and taking care of everything else and then last kind of last ditch effort is vasopressor therapy and it's okay to give in a trauma patient but you don't want to, it doesn't you don't want to make it the first line so if they come in the door and they're hypotensive uh, you don't want to be like oh uh, get the vaso here we go because if this is a trauma patient you're going to assume that they are bleeding and you're assuming they need blood first uh, so this is the patient if they're already in the ICU They've had a massive transfusion. You th you're pretty sure, right? You have all those numbers. You're pretty sure that you're in the sweet spot of resuscitation. They've got the blood. They've got. They're starting to coagulate. All that stuff is going on, and they still are uh, hypotensive. Uh, it's possible uh, because of different mechanisms that they need a little epinephrine, uh, nor norepinephrine. And a lot of times, uh, you know, I put dobutamine there. It's not really uh, technically indicated in. Uh, traumatic shock, but uh, one thing to think about is I, I did a, my residency with Manny Rivers who did a lot of the septic shock and early goal directed therapy work in the early 2000s and uh, which is you know sort of being uh, is sort of controversial at this point, but he is a very smart guy. I listen to him a lot and one of the things he always talked about was in shock, your organs are uh, are failing, right? And so that means the heart too. And so if the, the heart is failing because you're in shock, then you may need help. And what does dobutamine do? And dobutamine helps the heart work. So that is something to consider. In, that is actually just my opinion and Manny Rivers' opinion, honestly. Uh, and it's really not uh, in the, real, the trauma literature. So that's uh, my little two cents. Okay, TXA, uh, transamic acid. So uh, TXA essentially is a synthetic analog of amino acid lysine. And what that does is block the fibrinogen uh, degradation or fibrin degradation. Fibrin is the thing that kind of preserves the platelets come to, remember that uh, video, the platelets come to the uh, area of injury and they start form forming a platelet plug, then the fibrin comes and stabilizes that. And then we can have, if we have too much fibrinolysis from plasmin, uh, then uh, that platelet or that plug will break down. And so that's what we want to prevent, that's what we prevent with TXA and the dose is one gram over 10 uh, minutes and then one gram over the second eight hours. And essentially, um, it is, uh, Amicar is one of the drugs that we usually use for this and it's about eight times um, uh, efficacious or the strength is Amicar. So this is the little uh, uh, graph I made for, just to give you an idea where TXA fits in all this. So plasminogen is, 
is uh, hanging out in the blood. It's not activated. It gets activated by TPA, uh, and then it turns into plasma. The plasma then acts on fibrin, cuts the fibrin, um, in, and then um, destabilizes the clot. Uh, TXA stops the uh, transfer of plasminogen to plasmin and act, or I guess activation of plasmin. Okay, and so there's a couple big studies that have done about this in CRASH-2 trials, the one I think everyone quotes, and it's a 10,000 or 20,000 patient study. Essentially, they showed all-cause mortality at 28 days was significantly reduced by TXA, 14.5% uh, of the patients in the TXA group uh, mortality, 28-day mortality, and 16% in the placebo group. And then risk of death due to bleeding was also reduced to 4.9% in the TXA group and it was 5.7% in the placebo group with a statistical significance. And so essentially this study is saying that TXA is, uh, given in, uh, we're talking about early enough, uh, stops that fibrinolysis and does save some patients from uh, dying of hemorrhagic shock. Now there's a big study, there's a small difference, but it is a difference. There's another big study uh, done by the military, um, and this is five some thousand patients, six thousand patients, and they essentially said uh, their findings are consistent with to with the the crash two trial. However, uh, they do you do need to be careful of the adverse effects of TXA, which are uh, clotting. Right, you're going to stop you stop the fibrinolysis, uh, so you're going to create more clot. The study also said that the patients did better the sooner you gave it. So uh, if you gave it after three hours, uh, after the in uh, three hours after the injury, then the patients, it, there was no difference uh, in giving it or not giving it. And if you gave it an hour into the injury or less than an hour, then they did better than those patients that got it, say, at the third hour. So um, the sooner the better on TXA. The adverse effects, uh, thromboembolic events, PE, DVT, MI, CVA, renal cortical necrosis, and retinal artery occlusion have been uh, reported the first basically PE and DVT are the big ones uh, MI if it's a elderly patient or something like that so those are you have to look out for so TXA recommendations essentially adult trauma patients over 16 years old uh, ongoing or significant hemorrhage systolic blood pressure less than 90 or heart rates over 110 so basically somebody's in hemorrhagic shock and you think they're going to require a lot of blood transfusion so you should start the infusion within three hours of the injury um, if you don't get it within three hours of the injury it's really you don't need to give it at all because it's, it's not going to do any good anymore. They have to have no contraindication and you should be aware of thromboembolic uh, adverse effects. So conclusion of the whole talk is essentially number one, hemorrhagic shock can be treated early and swiftly, right? You can use it to pick up those subtle signs of hemorrhagic shock when the patient has an injury um, and start treating them right away. Damage control resuscitation includes permissive hypotension, uh, prompt control of hemorrhage and coagulation. And of course, uh, return to uh, physiological stability. MTP pro protocol should be activated um, if you think the patient is going to have more, or going to need more than 10 units of packed RBCs. Now, if you're not sure and they're bleeding and they're hypotensive and you're like, holy crap, this patient's dying in front of me, um, I need to do something to, they're in hemorrhagic shock, you want to start the MTP protocol, that's okay. You know, giving them six units of. Uh, pack cells and six of FAP and six of platelets, that's okay too. And then TXA should, remember, it should be given within three hours of injury. That is it. Thank you guys very much for listening, watching, and uh, you can follow me on Instagram or check out my YouTube videos. That'd be awesome. And I'll see you around the hospital if you're watching this for St. Mark's. If not, maybe I'll see you somewhere around the world. All right, you guys, take care. Thank you very much.